nice to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, this is my website. Uh, as Christian said, yeah, I doing CSS for quite a long time. Uh, I actually started writing articles even before 2011, just not in English. And uh, I think some of them were very outdated uh, because yeah, I think I started uh, doing CSS professionally from 2007. So yeah, quite a long time now. <laughs> Uh, on my side, yeah, I like to gather different experiments and uh, articles about CSS, um, and there is a bunch of them. Uh, I want to like start just showing all my not all my experiments, but a speci some specific ones which I did publish, and then I would talk about a few that I did not yet publish and planning on working on articles in the future. I start like from 2011, uh, as you can see. Uh, just like some radio buttons. Uh, this thing, like, still not possible easily. Anchor positioning would help us with this, actually. And a lot of other things, like, yeah, transitions uh, were possible in 2011. Uh, a lot of other things that I did, I, I still like. I like to like play with my experiments. I'm doing some demos. Uh, you can do radio buttons, checkboxes, style things differently. Uh, and even here, I think there are like two very interesting things. One is that, so uh, yeah, it doesn't work well when zoomed. When you toggle this radio buttons, yeah, it's radio buttons. But sometimes you want radio buttons that can be unselected. So by clicking on one of them, which is currently selected, you unselect that. So we still don't have something like that natively. I think Lea Viru, which Christian mentioned, had an issue in CSS VG or maybe in open UI. I don't remember exactly where, about like an ability to add, or it's I think it was just a blog post maybe she had about yeah, an ability to have some way to natively deselect radio buttons because because we already have in radio buttons this unselected state right away. In this case, I'm hacking it by providing a fourth value, which is basically absolutely positioned around the currently selected one. And another interesting thing here is this is just a native form. There is no JavaScript. Uh, when you select things, uh, you can click here. It resets because it's a button type reset. We have it. Not very often used, but because this is a form, this checkboxes, radio buttons, it just works. Uh, some other things just, yeah, I did a lot of experiments like, yeah, 2012. Uh, just CSS detecting from which side you're hovering over something. Uh, this is maybe still one of my favorite experiments. I think I did a lightning talk about some of it at Frontiers back uh, at, yeah, there is a big gap, like 2012, 2018. And actually at Frontiers, I think at 2012, I did mention this experiment. And in this article, I'm saying that, yeah, for quite a long time, I would not like do it properly. Uh, and uh, thanks to Yuna and one of her articles, like very often you get inspiration from pe pe other people doing experiments. I did find actually some inspiration to finish it. And what this is, is like five in a row. It's a game you can play with two people. And yeah, it just works. There is no JavaScript involved. It tracks uh, the turn order. It tracks the direction where you're placing things. And it's actually not a, that many code. It's not like you have an inf like a very long list of all possible permutations. It's just some CSS selectors, and that's it. And some very complicated stuff with uh, counters. Uh, if you did not see it, I invite you to look at it. The code is bad because it's a very experimental thing as a lot of other things. However, one of the things that Christian already mentioned in the introduction was this my experiment uh, with scrolling shadows. Uh, and this was, yeah, 2012. And Lea Viru did both uh, mentioned it in her blog post. So yeah, we can, you can go look at it. And she also mentioned it in her book, CSS Secrets. So yeah, I, I'm quoted in this book of Lear Viru. So th that was nice. I wish she would uh, write next her next book, probably about CSS arrivals. Uh, it would be really interesting to read. Um, so this experiment, uh, yeah, 
like 2012, uh, using, in my case, pseudo elements and Leah's case, uh, backgrounds, like you can overlay multiple backgrounds, use background attachment to make it so one background goes over another. And when you scroll, an element goes away. But this was kind of a hack. Uh, these days, I really like to play with scroll-driven animations, which we currently got uh, in stable Chrome, and hopefully we we will get soon in other browsers. And here, I wrote a few articles about it. I would not go through all the examples in them. But for example, one of the demos that I did with scroll-driven animation is the same experiment, just showing shadows, hiding shadows when you scroll. But this time, it's I think proper implementation still maybe a bit more code that I would want to, but it's like using a feature as intended. You scroll things, things change on scroll, scroll driven animation. Maybe animation part is not exactly that, but I do this. Uh, like you can see that we have have different states of the shadow as you scroll, and uh, it's really nice. And another thing that is nice uh, with scroll. Like scroll driven animations, what we can do, uh, like the first examples in this article, is having a stack state. So we have an element with position sticky, and we can actually apply some stack state, but like in a very uh, flexible manner. Like Chrome currently have a prototype of state queries for stack, but it would be only binary state. You can only turn it on and off. Scroll-driven animations allows us to do this very fluidly. Like you can scroll, and based on the position of a scroll relative to the scroll port and the element, we can adjust its styles and make it so that yeah, we can make elements stack, make them uh, not make them stack because they're stuck because of sticky position, but make them like, stack maybe because we can pass like a value of uh, another to another. So yeah, there's a lot of things we can do with them. Uh, one of my probably more popular recently experiment with scroll driven animations was fit with text, which we did not have like really any good ways to achieve in CSS. Uh, with scroll driven animations, we can. So this is actually an actual text. You can change it. You can uh, do whatever you want, and uh, it fits the container where it is. Like you might think, why scroll driven animations? I explain a bit in this article, but like the idea is with scroll driven animations, we can hook into a view of a scroll port and say, okay, if it's a, our element is located inside a view with a certain proportion, like if it's at the start, at the end, we can kind of know this proportion. In our case here, our text is just a very big font size, which goes outside of our container. So it's our flows. We know the viewport of it, scroll port. We know the proportions, how much it sticks out, which we can use for scroll-driven animation on this element, and use the transform to scale it back exactly with this proportion. So it's actually like very simple uh, method. It, it just works. We need to make a bit of hacks, like uh, also adjust the bottom margin, because transform does not change the actual layout of an element to pull up our elements, but it still works. And now I'm going into territory where some of my not yet published experiments. Uh, fit with text was like a very interesting idea. I was thought, what else could we do with text which does not fit? Like CSS is awesome, is a great example. Like when things do not fit, CSS provides a lot of ways to actually handle this. We could have text overflow ellipses. We could scale things with scrolling animations. But uh, like, what would happen if we would resize this? I don't know. Maybe something like this. Uh, yeah. So in this case, uh, I'm actually not using scroll driven animations. Uh, the proper imp implementation of this probably would use them in order to get the width of this text, because currently I'm kind of hard coding by its width. Uh, but uh, another good point of what we have here is that it actually works in all the latest versions of all browsers. So it works in Chrome Canary, it works in latest Safari, it works in Firefox Nightly, because it uses some calculations and uh, tangents, a tangents, uh, like a tan, a tan two method that Jane Ori came up with in order to get a division of two, like a width and another width. So in this case, we can have a container width, we can have some our 
uh, widths that we know of an element, which we can kind of get with scroll driven animations, and we can divide them and get proportion, and then through some calculations, get the angle. And in this case, it's a bit more complicated because we kind of need to make sure that the element fits into its corner like nicely. So because like we need to calculate the offset from the corner. So yeah, it's a really nice thing. I would probably write an article about it. So yeah, stay tuned. Uh, another thing that uh, scroll driven animations allowed me to experiment with was actually a thing by Scott Allen, uh, Callum. Uh, sorry for Scott for yeah Callum, uh, who was at CSS Cafe uh, in June, and he was actually talking about this thing, and he actually did write a CSS VG issue about this back in two thousand twenty one, and forty eight comments later, right now there actually is a specification about this uh, for progress function and some others. It is in a very rough draft. It's still very experimental. Probably the name might ch might change. The way it's uh, ex ex intended to work might change. But uh, even better thing that uh, in November 20, Chromium developers started to actually prototype it. So in Chrome Canary, you can start trying this. Not everything, it still does not work. I did already try it. I did comment in the here in the issue. We did discover that there was an error in specification because it provided a formula which was implemented by Chrome developers, but it actually was not doing what the specification did intend to do. So I went to the specs, uh, wrote there, people saw it, and uh, I think it was uh, yeah Miriam Suzanne who did fix the specification, and now the formula is here is correct. Implementation is not, but soon I hope it would be changed. So here it's not using progress, but it's using scroll animation to achieve what Scott wanted to achieve. We can map uh, different states of a font or anything else to the width of a container. So in this case, when we resize the container, we have some minimum uh, um, like step, stop, and maximum. And between them, we map font size, font weight, and a color. And we can map whatever we want. In our case, it's actually uh, you, just very simple way, uh, even maybe easier than with the current progress, because this specification with progress would provide a lot of other things that will allow us control this. But in our case, we have an animation. Let me maybe zoom here things a bit, maybe not that much. Uh, and if we would go here, so we have yeah headline, and you can see that it's very uh, logical. We have zero stop, 100% stop, going from font size uh, 1.2 rem, font weight 900, and so on, to a different value at 100%. And then we define in our container um, like mean and uh, max values, and we can interpolate between them. So yeah, this is already possible in Chrome. Uh, it's kind of possible with the same method by Jane Ori uh, with uh, tangents and attangents, but maybe we would uh, yeah get a better support for it because there is a lot of browser bugs around how they are cal calculated, which values they get. We have to use some add property hacks in order to make it work properly. But yeah, there is a lot of stuff going on. And speaking of another things that we couldn't do before, uh, I think like this article by Rachel Andrew, who did also in the past did a talk at CSS Cafe, uh, in 2019 talked about things we can't yet do in CSS. The interesting part is that nothing what she mentions is still possible uh, to do uh, as intended. Uh, the idea is that we have a lot of things in multi-column layout, uh, which is I think one of the most overlooked like CSS features. Mostly because it's have some cross-browser uh, compatibility issues, but it's very nice. However, yeah, it's what is possible in print still not possible to do natively. And this article talks about a lot of things that yeah, it would be really nice to have. I highly recommend reading it. And uh, I think she mentions an issue here in CSS working group, or maybe not. But uh, either way, there is a CSS. Uh, working group issue about like an ability to enhance various multicolumn issues. So whenever I see something that, okay, we cannot do this in CSS, I feel challenged. I want to fix this and find a way to actually 
do something about it. Like, for example, here she proposes a lot of things like we can have an uh, intrusion. In regular CSS, like this is like multi columns, text flows. You can have a plot which is located on one side of a column, but we currently do not have any way to put it this way. Uh, we Adobe proposed at some point CSS regions and inclusions uh, specs, which I think were implemented in uh, Microsoft Edge before it changed the engine to Cr Chromium. Now, so now we don't have it and specification is uh, basically that, but this is like a, a really nice thing that would be nice to do. I did implement it, so it kind of works, but as you can see, yeah, at some point, it's not really working well. Uh, the issue is I'm implementing the scroll-driven animations, and this issue uh, shows why it's not that easy. Because it's blinking, because uh, there is a circularity issue. Uh, in order to do this layout, some of the things inside uh, recalculate, and we have columns of kind of unknown width, we have height, which is kind of unknown, and this list it's just on some uh, like borderline cases, it does not work well and it basically rotates through two different states. But yeah, for some of the cases, it's possible to implement something like this. I would probably mention it in one of my further articles, but yeah. Uh, not always things are do not work correctly and not everything is practical. So sometimes I do experiments, which I, I'm not even sure I would mention in any of the articles I would write, but maybe I would write something smaller. So in this case, we have like a scrollable container. We have an element which floats um, your regular stuff. What would happen if we would scroll things? Yeah, the, the element is actually like absolutely positioned almost, but the text still floats around it. Uh, yeah, it's just, as you expect, uh, some scrolling animations are involved. And uh, probably not very practical. You would not ha want to have like a banner this way, maybe. Uh, but I imagine there might be a possible use for it. Yeah, something fun. Another fun thing that I sometimes think about, like you could notice that I do a lot of things related to typography. And it's very interesting how scroll driven animations uh, fix a bunch of issues around typography, around typographic layouts and stuff. And whenever like I read some of my typography books, uh, one thing that I notice is that often you have some column of text and usually on one page, the sidebar is like on one side, on the left, then you uh, look at another page, it's on the right. What if we could have the same on the web? So we have a narrow container and at the start, okay, we have this first page and then second page and the sidebar is on different places. In practice, I don't think you would want to do this. It, this is a not very good reading experience. I'm sorry like, if it causes like, some issues and some of the examples may be a bit, yeah, not very good in this regard. And usually scroll animations, uh, this is not the way to do them. You, or you want to hide things that you do like that through a preferred reduced motion. But it's still really nice to think about various typography related things that you could want to see in the web and experiment with them. There are still so many things that we either cannot do or might be complicated to do what people used to do in print. And it's really nice just to think about it and think of different ways we could enhance our layouts. Not everything is possible. One thing that Rachel did mention in her article is an ability to have uh, a block level wrap for multiple columns when the height is set. By default, uh, what happens is that whenever there is multi many, many columns, they just did go through like in one line. It is not possible to wrap them in any way. Here, it's like an experiment that I did not actually complete. It's not working like perfectly. It's just maybe as an idea of how it could be done. Uh, but you can see that, yeah, we kind of can uh, change the number of columns. Uh, and in this case, our page, uh, which does not wrap, always tries to stay inside this kind of fake viewport with the pink border. Uh, so we have four columns. When it starts to overflow, okay, we break it. Our text go here, 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 then goes here, here, here by multi-column layout. 
And here we get like an element which appears and spans all. And in this case, uh, it makes it so, yeah, things kind of wrap, but not really. Uh, it's not really usable. It's used like media queries to adjust things. And I think there were also some circularity issues, uh, but it's not, not, doesn't even look that, that good. But I really hope that one day there would be actual way to achieve this with CSS because you very often would want to have multiple columns of some content, but you don't want people to scroll up and down. You want people to read everything on the screen, then scroll down. With scroll snapping, it would be very easy to make sure that like the page, the layout stays in the same place. But currently, yeah, there are no good ways of making uh, regions flow uh, with multi-column from like row to row to row without like hacks like that. Uh, all of that was like scrolling animations. Second thing that I really enjoyed re recently is like anchor positioning, which uh, my first article goes to this March. I wouldn't show a lot of examples. Uh, maybe one of the kind of references, yeah, transitions one, I think that I did show at the beginning. So if we go to controls, yeah, it's very similar thing to this, uh, but now it's kind of implemented uh, not natively, but almost natively with transitions for elements uh, where our highlight adapts to the width of an element. We don't hard code any values here outside of the index of an element because with Scroll driven and or not, not with the uh, anchor position, we still do not have a lot of good ways to have transition when we change the anchor name. Uh, like, if you don't know what anchor position is, uh, there would be an article that I would share later that you could read to get it better, but uh, yeah, a bit later on it. Uh, but yeah, uh, anchor positioning is a thing that I'm really excited about, it would not be here sh soon. But I did a lot of experiments with it. There are a lot of very nice things that is possible to do. Uh, like we can have uh, elements that basically span from one element to another when absolutely positioned. And we can uh, make it so, like in this case, the animation has to use top, left, bottom, right, because we cannot anchor position things to transforms because transforms are the last thing that applies. So the an actual, uh, reality, you would not use this in production as a positioning method for things like that. But what this example demonstrated and others below as well is that we can have any number of elements and we can make connections between them. And anchor positioning is all about it. Uh, we can make it so that, yeah, we draw some rectangle or whatever from one element to another and do different things with them. In this example, for example, we are using an SVG, which rotates properly because SVG makes this uh, possible. When I was writing this article, this was not possible with just CSS, but I think with like Tanka's uh, Tanatan method and maybe something else, we could achieve this with CSS as well. I would need to experiment with it. But yeah, I would not go through all the experiments in this article. I think actually there is one that yeah does not work. I would need to update it. I think because this anchor positioning is an experiment which did change, you can see how it was looking when it was working because I provide uh, recently videos for every article that I write, which talks about uh, things that is not supported everywhere. Uh, so you can visit not necessarily in Chrome Canary, but in any browser and look at all the videos of all the examples. But yeah, uh, this technique allows us to have connections going through elements without any hard coding. So no hard coded heads with uh, positions. Uh, it's very neat. Uh, but when doing uh, these experiments, uh, I did a lot of things that I did not yet publish and just some very interesting things. Like for example, we can sometimes animate things from unknown widths in this case. So we can have some button with some text and we trans, uh, transform a width of this wrapper inside to the width of its parent. Uh, right now with CSS, it's not really possible because we don't uh, know the auto width or auto height and can tr transition. There are some plans to make it possible, but for now, anchor position is very easy to do this because we can change like the dimensions uh, which are used in the anchor position element and it using a transition for it. Another thing that's kind of related to scroll driven animations, like this is not really possible right now with just uh, anchor positioning. 
and it would not be possible because of the way it works. Uh, we cannot, uh, this is a limitation, we cannot hook uh, one element to, so it stays in one scroll port to an element in another scroll port. But with scroll driven animation, we can kind of get the position of an element somewhere and make it so we actually point to the proper place with anchor position as well. So yeah, there is a lot of nice ways we can combine uh, new technologies like scroll driven animations, scroll, uh, anchor positioning, and do a lot of other things. This is probably the only example that uses JavaScript. It uh, is setting the position of a cursor, which is uh, then very easy to use as a part of anchor positioning. Like for example, here we use the position that is set through JavaScript uh, inside the element as one coordinate and another one is getting it from anchor positioning. And there is actually an issue uh, about like providing something like that in CSS natively. I'm not exactly sure if we would actually get something like that because I think an ability to actually read the cursor can be like a bit uh, potentially bad for security reasons. But maybe we would get something like this because a lot of examples in the web you can see where we can get the position of a cursor and there's so many things that we can do in CSS with this. Another uh, nice thing that I did not yet share but probably write a small article about is how we can use uh, anchor positioning to handle focus. So here you can see that this focus outline actually exists outside of our scroll port. And anchor positioning is something that allows us to do this. Uh, very often when you have some scrollable containers, you have some focus states. If you are not relying on the browser built one, which sometimes can uh, escape the scrolling, there is no really a good way without JavaScript to support something like that. With uh, anchor positioning, it's very easy to have an element which is positioned outside of our scroll port. And, it, Probably in this case, we could also want to use scroll driven animations. And when this element goes outside of the bounds of our scroll port, hide it. So uh, this is something that I would probably implement if I would write an article about it. But yeah, there is like a lot of things that possible with uh, anchor positioning. Probably one of the most often cases that would be there is uh, using for tooltips and popovers. Here's an example of a thing that I for sure write an article about about how, so yeah, you can have this, this element which does not yet overflow. Uh, if we would resize this container, it overflows and there are two tips that shown with this content. Uh, if we would, it shows on hover, it shows on focus. If we would resize, it goes away. Uh, oh, CSS. Uh, best part is that due to anchor positioning, if we would focus it and then like drag our container around, we can see how fallback mechanism in anchor positioning works. Again, it's all CSS. Uh, the fallback mechanism that is currently implemented in Clone Canary would probably change because there are a lot of changes in specifications that are ongoing. But uh, yeah, this is something that is really nice to have from the box. You don't need to have any dependencies uh, in JavaScript in order to achieve this. And Anchor positioning is really neat. It provides a lot of other things. I wrote another article about it just a week ago, exactly a week ago, about how we can use it to fix the shrink wrap problem. I think the best is to skip a lot of things that I write to go to the example that probably the most common for this issue. Very often we can have text that wraps, but you want to have a container that goes around the actual text that did wrap. Uh, right now, there is no good way to implement this because of the way CSS works. In this article, you can read what exactly is happening. But without the fix, usually you get this. Uh, whenever text wraps in CSS, if it's automatic wrap, its container expands to fit the all possible space. There is no way around it outside of placing hard uh, breaks like a BR or wrapping elements in like inline blocks and stuff like that, and then having like display block. But with anchor positioning, it's a very neat thing is that you can position an element relative to an inline element. And when you position things to inline elements, when they wrap, it's positioned uh, along uh, using all the line boxes, uh, it, like the final fragments, which are there. And yeah, it just works. 
Uh, it's written in the specs, so this is probably would be there. But yeah, it's really nice that it's possible to do things like that. Here's an example of uh, some other cases where it helps. Like uh, usually when you implement like something like this, yeah, without a way to prevent like automatically wrapped content, you would not actually get to this. And in all these examples, what is neat is that uh, I think one of the top examples show this, yeah. Uh, the new text wrap balance, uh, it would be, I think it's renamed to some other values, but is implemented currently in browsers by this name. Not everywhere, look for like, can I use uh, or MDN information if you can use it, but it's very easy to fall back. But you can see that, yeah, usually with balance, it's much more of an issue. If you would start using text or balance in some of your elements, if you are not using it, uh, uh, without like fixes like this, and for now you cannot because anchor position is not yet here, uh, you would get something like this. So this is one case where text wrap balance can hit you. Like you would expect things to look nicely when you use it, but you would not don't want to use it everywhere. Without text wrap balance, this bubble would look better just because the text would go further and it would not look that unbalanced with so much free space. Maybe at one point we get this fixed. I don't think we would ever get this fixed in CSS. Of course, never say never, but when I tried to fix this with some Schrodinger animations, of course, uh, I did stumble across a bunch of circularity issues where it was just blinking and or it just stays at some state and does not go anywhere else. Maybe I would write an article about this or mention this in my article about a lot of other Schrodinger animation stuff that I did mention. When doing this example, uh, there were a lot of other things that I did implement. For example, th this is a very simple thing, uh, which sounds simple, but yeah, we can have an element which is in line and we can kind of wrap the ground around it uh, with slanted uh, corners uh, based on the actual text inside. Uh, all thanks to anchor positioning and a lot of very complicated calculations. Because yeah, this is not a, a, an easy thing to do, even with how it allows us to place multiple, like uh, anchor to nine elements. I have to place like one any additional element at the start, at the end. Use uh, multiple elements positions and calculations. But yeah, all CSS, and it's kind of possible to do this. Uh, yeah, and I think this all for all the experiments that I did uh, talk to today about. Uh, the last thing is just today. Uh, it's co coincidence, but uh, an article by me in 12 Days of Web by Stephanie Eccles, who was here as a speaker, uh, I think just last time, uh, was published. Uh, so this is kind of overview of what is the state of anchor positioning now. It has a bunch of demos. Uh, I won't show them here, so you could have some surprises when you visit it. Not a lot of demos. I'm mostly talking about like, OK, it's not ready yet, but it's in the, in the works. This this is like too long, didn't read. But uh, yeah, you can read it. Uh, in the end, I provide a lot of links to different other articles by me and by other people like Yuna or uh, others who did experiment with the scroll, with anchor positioning as well. So yeah, uh, and that's probably it for me. Uh, if you have any questions, I would be glad to answer. I would probably not show any code for existing experiments just because uh, I would want to keep it under wraps until I actually write articles about them. And th another thing is that for me, usually when I, I experiment on CSS, the best thing is not to look into the source. This was something that I was talking at one of the uh, lightning talks and frontiers back in 2013, I think. Uh, but whenever you see something nice in the web, the best way to learn is to try implement it yourself. So whenever you see something like this, the best thing is not to try and look into the source, how was it done, but go read the specs, read MDN, uh, go open your browser, your text editor, and play with it and try to implement like anything that you see, uh, even if it's something that you think is not possible. Uh, for example, where was it? Uh, doo -doo -doo. Uh, the article by Rachel Andrew. Yeah, this one. 
So whenever you see that there's something not possible, you can still try to implement it. Uh, no one says you that you should not try it. Uh, if someone says you that something is not possible, it's not usually the case, uh, especially given how not a lot of people are that knowledgeable about CSS these days. So yeah, uh, if you can sometimes do things in CSS, not always it's a good idea. Sometimes th the ways which are hacky is bad and probably would would not want to use them in production but by experimenting you get to know the technology much closer and sometimes some of the ways that you experiment on could actually be applied in uh, actual production code and often could make things much more performant because like Schroeder animations is always would be perform more performant than any solution that tries to emulate this on javascript just because it's built in the browser it uses everything that browser provides to you and it would be done at proper like, uh, time and uh, yeah, would be handled much better than any JavaScript solution. So yeah, I really encourage you to go and experiment, uh, read articles, uh, read specifications, contribute to them. Like if you see some something that you do not understand in the specification, a good idea to go ask somewhere in social networks like on Mastodon, uh, what do you not understand? Like if you do not understand something in the specification, it's a good signal to authors to actually go and maybe change the wording so it would be more understandable. Or you could encounter some issues, especially in the emerging uh, specifications like prototypes and stuff. So yeah, there is a lot of things to try and uh, experiment on on web platform. And these years for CSS were very good. Like only this year, like anchor positioning, scroll driven animations, so many things to try and play with. And with scroll animations, hopefully next year other browsers would catch up and we could start using them more in production at some point. So yeah, thank you.